and um, so uh, let's get started. So let's go over the agenda first. Um, so it's the agenda for Friday, 327. Now this was supposed to be the last day of class, um, but we do have a class on Tuesday. Hopefully everybody has that invitation. Um, is there anybody who does not have that invitation? Um, Mark, this is Regina. I just wanted to remind you that I won't be able to attend that class. Right, I, I know that. Okay. And, and okay. Uh, if you want to follow up with me afterward, that's, that would be great. Um, okay. Um, if you want to talk through some of that or any follow-ups on that. Uh, okay. We'll be, I, I hope we'll be following up on the project as well. Um, so yeah. that will give some ample time to do that. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah. But I do remember that. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so we'll start out with some Q&A, as we always do, and uh, talk a little bit of a review. And then we'll get into the three topics that I want to talk about today. Um, FMEA, MSA, which stands for Measurement Systems Analysis. This I really want to go away from the book. Why do I want to do this? For two <laughs> reasons. One uh, is, the, and the major one, is that the book is very Minitab oriented. Minitab has a great facility for doing measurement systems analysis, uh, professional measurement systems analysis, um, and that's what was covered. However, uh, that doesn't mean that we can't do really effective measurement systems analysis, and it's not important for us to do it. Uh, there's a lot of value in doing some really simple things and now that we've covered DOE, it's going to make a lot of sense uh, what this is. Usually people cover measurement systems analysis when we're doing measuring, and it turns out that it's actually the structure for designed experiment, and people get very confused, which just makes sense. I, I would get confused then as well. So we'll go away from the book, and uh, we'll just kind of do it on the whiteboard, and we'll do a couple of examples and uh, call it a day. And then I want to go into week eight. <clears throat> and week eight is, is kind of a smattering of things. So week eight, uh, this will finish up week seven, um, and then we'll go into week eight. Week eight is a smattering of things. There's uh, the sort of the standard stuff, uh, which is all about the control phase. Um, so we'll talk uh, monitoring things, standardizing things, um, and uh, uh, writing a control plan. But, you know, those are also some things that uh, when we look at them, we're going to basically say, hmm, well, they may be hard to do, but they're pretty straightforward. Um, for example, a control plan really is a lot of documentation of what you've done, of what is the current process now that you've updated it, what do you need to keep measuring, what's the training that you need to keep it going, things like that. We all know it's hard to do, but it's easy to conceptualize. Um, the second thing is um, sort of advanced technical topics. <clears throat> and uh, those advanced technical topics that we covered in the last week um, are queuing theory and optimization. And I want to break those up a little bit, so that's why I want to do queues today. Um, and uh, there, there are videos on this, so you can go back and look at them. Um, they're very complete ones, um, so, so that's good. The other one is optimization that uses... Um, if you haven't ever used it, um, it's a tool that um, you'll, I think you'll find uh, very mm, astounding if you haven't used it yet before, uh, called the Excel Solver. Um, and there are professional grade uh, ex uh, things of that as well, but the Excel Solver actually does some pretty good stuff. So we'll show you how to do some optimization uh, with that. And then there's sort of, um, <clears throat> I'd say, other other paradigms and these are I'll just tell you right now these are designed for Six Sigma and Hoshin Conry both of these are are complex systems in their own right but the core of all this is really understanding DMAIC uh, the DFSS is the equivalent of DMAIC when um, when you have design so in other words, if you're designing something from scratch, <clears throat> that's what this is. It's the process, it's a rigorous process to do um, this design from scratch when you have a design problem. And then <clears> Hoshin <throat> Conry is really about business planning. 
but with a with a quality bent. So, um, because we're black belts, we probably at least need to know just the, the the basics of those things. And when I say basics, I really mean what's the language that people use. We're not going to teach DFSS or Hoshin Conry. And again, there's a couple of videos on those that I'll I'll have you watch. We may have some time to talk about it. Uh, we may not uh, have any more time than what we just said. So uh, let's get into it, uh, I guess, right away. Let's start with any uh, questions that you have. What questions do you have from last lecture, from previous lectures? Okay. Um, I think last time when we finished, um, oh, I guess before, before we get into this, um, I've given you feedback on assignment number two. Um, long time coming, I know. No excuses for that. It's terrible. Um, and it really doesn't fit in with uh, what we just covered in terms of giving feedback and, and all that uh, in the ABC analysis stuff. Um, so I, I want to turn the ones that you just turned in. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really, really try hard to get them to you on Monday. Um, <clears throat> and Monday a.m. If, if, uh, if possible. That way I can do it on the weekend. Um, but that way you'll have the, all that back and, and, uh, while you're still in the, sort of in the class mode before we finish it. So I want to get the assignment three back to you uh, by then. Um, uh, Michael, yours bounced when I sent it back, so I've put it on the FTP site like uh, before. I got a notice that it wasn't accepted on, your, on the, the PNCN. Um, Great. Thank you. Yep. Um, all right. Um, so let's go into um, uh, last time we covered. Uh, I think it was called. We said behavioral analysis, and I'll just be very brief here. And we covered three things. We covered ABC analysis. We covered uh, reinforcement. And we covered feedback. And without writing a book, or without you know, with keeping it as simple as we can, you know, what was what was ABC analysis? What do you use it for, and what does it do for you, and how does it work? So, what was ABC analysis? Anybody remember that? The Knicks and the picks. Yeah, okay, so that sounds like that was Gina. So, picks and nicks, excellent. So, the idea is that if we analyze, if, if we have a process and we need people to act out this process, there are certain behaviors that we're going to want and perhaps even certain behaviors that we don't want. Like, for example, use the standard operating procedure. That's a behavior, right? Somebody either does or they doesn't or they, doesn't, or they don't use it. Um, so, that would be a behavior. And so, <clears throat> so Regina, how does ABC analysis work? Um, it, it, let's suppose that it is that, that, that we're trying to get somebody to use an SOP. Um, that's the behavior that we want. How would we go about analyzing uh, what are the drivers? So uh, you could brainstorm the consequences, which could be negative or positive. Got and it. then list them all out. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you'd look at, uh, you'd identify each one as either positive or negative. Mm -hmm. And then if it's uh, an immediate impact or a future, relatively okay. speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the last piece would be if it's uh, certain to happen or uncertain. Excellent. Okay, great. So you, uh, you write out the consequences, then you score all those, and, um, and then what do you do? <laughs> uh, then you take a look at and you identify um, of those consequences which ones have the PIC mm -hmm. and which ones have uh, the NIC. And those Excellent. are the ones that you're going to look at. Great. And so uh, behaviors that have lots of picks are behaviors that are going to be positively reinforced. Oops, I've used a word there that I was going to ask you about. <laughs> right? <laughs> These are the behaviors that are going to happen. 
these are the behaviors that are negatively reinforced. Okay, so, um, so these are the behaviors that are going to tend not to happen. But that's the idea, is the picks and nicks drive. <laughs> First of all, I, you hit the nail on the head. It's consequences that drive uh, behavior. Now, again, we're putting this into the process context. So it's consequences in a process that are going to drive repeated behavior. It's not the antecedents, which are things like advertising or slogans, you know, quality's job one, or, or you know, everybody's just got to buck up and, and do the right thing here. Um, those are all kind of advertisements, right? Um, um, it's, the, it's the consequences that are going to drive repeat behaviors. Those that have lots of picks are being reinforced. Um, those that have lots of nicks are going to be uh, negatively reinforced. In other words, those behaviors are going to be extinguished. Um, so what would be an example of a, somebody other, thank you, Gina. So what would be an example of some, something other than, uh, 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 what would be an example of a pick in a, um, in a, uh, in a process, in a behavior of a process? Steve, can I pick on you? Yes, I'm, I'm thinking. Oh, okay. Um, uh -huh. Of a pick. Well, a pick would be something that uh, make the make the performer uh, successful. So in a process, I guess if you are able to complete a task without making a mistake, uh, that would be a pick. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, good. So I, I think that works, right? So let's suppose you design a, a job form or something like that that somebody needs to, let's say, you know, somebody, the current state of the process is they do their job, they get no feedback immediately on whether they did it right or did it wrong. Um, let's suppose you design a, a, a worksheet such that if they do it all right, a, a, a red, <laughs> I'm sorry, not a red, a green button comes on and they can print, go ahead and they get a little... You know, we don't want to be too crazy on this one, but they, 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 before they click the button, they know that they've done it right. Um, that would be something that would potentially uh, immediately give them positive, uh, immediate and certain feedback. So that could be a pick. There's plenty of other, <clears throat> there's plenty of other examples uh, like that. Okay, good. Uh, what would be an example, somebody else, so thanks Steve. What would be an example of uh, what would be an example of, some, of negative reinforcement of uh, something that would be something that would make me not want to, um, or that might make me uh, might nick me? How about um, when you're going through security at an airport TSA? That makes you not want to fly. I'm sorry, what was that? TSA what? <laughs> it sounds like it's when right. You're through, when you're going through uh, security at the airport, TSA makes you not want to fly. Ah, okay. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I guess they should be doing better TSA uh, or better security on the pilots, though, now, I guess, right? Well, yeah, that's true. true well. <clears throat> yeah, that, that really makes me not want to fly. I'm, I'm going to... Uh, Oh God, I'm, I'm going to be there this summer. So anyway, I hope they get their uh, act together by then. I, I'm going to be scared. You know what? <laughs> I'm on that flight. <laughs> I'm not telling my kids about that. Anyway, um, anyway, yeah. So uh, good. So there's plenty of uh, negative reinforcement at a at an airport. Uh, no question about it. Um, I'm trying to think of. Um, what might be something that would negatively reinforce you uh, to uh, drive this to drive the speed limit? Or to not drive the speed limit? I'm sorry. Getting the ticket. Getting the ticket. Yeah. So uh, getting the ticket is good. I think the only thing that makes it not a nick is that it's not certain, right? So there's plenty of times when we speed that we don't get a ticket. So it's probably not a nick. I'm not saying this is the right thing, but do you think that we'd be less apt to speed if 
every time, let's say there were a monitor in our car, and every time we drove over that speed limit, whatever that speed limit was, that uh, we got a ticket. Um, I bet that would change my behavior. That would certainly, that's, that's an example of a negative reinforcement. That would be an example of a nick. Um, if every time I came late to a meeting, the person who was running the meeting chewed the crap out of me, um, right, just read me the riot act, that would make, that would, that would probably extinguish that behavior. It might not really make me pay attention at the meeting, but at least I'm going to show up on time. Um, so those are examples of nicks. And, and I think in the process, we went through the whole thing about negative and, and positive reinforcement. Um, and I just went through your, your examples that you had. I think we all get this. Um, just that the positive reinforcement is something that causes behavior to occur more often. Negative, be negative reinforcement is something that causes that behavior to extinguish. So uh, negative reinforcement can be everything from ignoring um, to giving admonitions uh, to putting up the barbed wire fence. Um, so all of those things would be negative reinforcement. They're trying to stop behaviors from happening. Um, positive reinforcements are things that try and get you to do it more. The most obvious one is to you know, give you a cookie or something like that uh, after you complete a task, but it doesn't have to be all that crude. Um, sometimes people just uh, you know, want to uh, get peer recognition or uh, understand that they're able to move on to something else um, because they've finished. It doesn't have to be um, a reward. Um, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. All right, and, and then we talked about feedback. And what were some of the things that we talked about with feedback when you're giving feedback? What are some good practices or best practices? To not just go by measurement alone? Not just, not just measurement alone. Okay, how about the other way around? How, how about just description alone? Right. Not, it, 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 go ahead. No, go ahead. Not just description alone either, right? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty rare. I think most of the time it is description, at least when, you know, when we get our yearly feedback. And there you go. In terms of performance reviews, what's one of the main issues with getting a, performance, a yearly performance review? It's not timely. It's not timely, so good feedback should be timely. That's why I was castigating myself for taking so long to get you that assignment number two. Um, uh, because now you're going to look at it and you're going to say, mm, I don't really even remember having that problem. Whereas if it would have been a week later, you would have said, oh, yeah, I had that problem. Now I know how to fix it. Um, so uh, shame on me for doing that. Um, so, yeah, it should be timely. Um, if it is, it, it's helpful if it is fact-based. Uh, we didn't talk about this too much in terms of measurements, but um, it's, I have a rule, at least with measurements, that I like to rate, not rank. What, am I, what, what does that mean to you? Rate, not rank. Like, I'll, I'll give you an example. I used to teach statistics at a college, and everybody said, are you going to be grading on a curve? And I said, no, I don't, I don't want to grade on a curve. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, I know how to give a test. I'm not interested in testing my test. And a lot of people didn't understand that, but before I explain that, it gets to the heart of the difference between rating and not, and not ranking. Why wouldn't you want to rank? Plenty of companies rank, by what? the way. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. It because um, like if you were in a workplace and you were a ranking department, for example, it could cause tension between departments because one may feel like I'm better than the other one. Mm -hmm. um, whereas rating is a little bit more, um, I guess, more individualized. You know, you rating based on um, what you expect from that uh, person yeah. or department. Yeah, I th I think so. Mm hmm. Any other comments, questions, or, or comments? If, uh, if someone or, or other people that you are comparing against are, you know, just average or, or, or even excellent, you know, it sort of skews where you are because if you're, 
if you're good and someone else is also just quote unquote good, then you're doing fine. But it doesn't necessarily, you know, it might not be the same as saying, well, you are this, sort of looking at it in isolation rather than comparing it to someone else. Right. Right. And I, I think that's I think that's the kind of point that's the point that I wanted to drive home is that we as management need to know the performance standards that are going to be acceptable and not just acceptable, but good. Um, that that's the onus is on us to be to do that, right? I mean I don't think that for those of us who manage people, I don't think there's too many people that I hired that I wanted to fail. In fact I think there's zero. I want them all to succeed. So if <clears throat> if I can create a system where I'm rating people, right, where I'm rating them relative to those those standards that that I put out there, um, if everybody is succeeding, that's either really good or my standards don't make sense, right? Um, but in theory, it should be good. Now I, I know that there's never any perfect world right here, and there's going to be a mix of this stuff. Um, but when you rank, you automatically create winners and losers, and um, Somebody's got to be at the top. Somebody's got to be at the bottom. Even if everybody's excellent, um, I know that in the Olympics that there's only one person who can win the gold medal. But in business, you can win by having more people win medals. Um, uh, if you have more people doing the right thing, um, you know you can you can win games. Um, and uh, so anyway, so I, I you know I have a very strong opinion on that. Obviously, uh, doesn't have to be yours, but. I recommend very highly whenever you can rating um, uh, above ranking. Uh, having said that, a lot of a lot of companies do indeed rank. Um, all right. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, any questions or comments on the behavioral analysis? Those are the three parts. Um, now, this stuff can be used anywhere in a project, but it is very very helpful uh, most often right here in the C phase um, and one of the re or in the late I phase when you're putting together improvements. One of the main reasons for it is because when you put together improvements a lot of the times at least in the past uh, my improvements have been efficiency improvements or things like that and it's really important to consider um, you know what the impact is going to be on uh, on the employees and this behavior analysis can sometimes help you think about that. <clears throat> in a structured way. All right. Yes. Uh, on feedback, um, and I didn't hear this. Um, what about separating uh, positive feedback? So let's say someone's rated highly. You shouldn't necessarily say, "But you could have done this better." <laughs> I think that's pretty common. Yes. So have you? So I was taught uh, since I went to consultant school. I didn't really, but somebody taught me this for sure. Um, they, they teach you the sandwich method. Is everybody familiar with this one? So the yeah, sandwich. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the sandwich method is: I say something good about you, and then I then I give my negative feedback, and then I say some other good stuff about you, so you feel okay walking away. The problem with that is if I say something like, "Oh, Regina, you did so great on that assignment last time." Um, but you know, you really screwed up problem number <laughs> 52, and I don't know what was going on there. You really need to pull your act together. Uh, but you know, on the other hand, I mean, you really did great on all the rest of the stuff, so good job. See you later. Now I'm going to talk to somebody else. What did you just hear? <laughs> uh, just that I did a bad job. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So I, I have a... a, a what I, what I like to do in those cases, and I, I, I try to do this, I don't, I'm not always great at doing it, but I try to do this. When I have somebody give me some work, I try and say, uh, when I find it, unless it's just really atrocious, I try and say, good job. And I, I take it, I might comment on some good things, right? If I can be more specific than that, that's great. And um, then I'm going to let some time pass. And uh, if there are things that I need to be critical, I'll let some time pass. It doesn't need to be a lot of time. It could be even 10 minutes or even an hour. Um, and uh, then I'll approach that person and say, you know, I really like what you gave me. I've thought about how we could maybe make it a little better. What do you think? And um, in that way, it's more of a problem-solving mode 
um, and I've given the person the I've given the person feedback for a, a, a behavior that I want. You know, I want the person to try um, and uh, and to do their best, and it can be very deflating if you if you give it other if you do it other ways. Anyway, that's one way I've tried. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, all good stuff. I hope you're really enjoying that book. I, I it's not a, it's not a fluff book. Um, there's lots of great uh, examples in there, and um, and uh, stuff really works. Okay, um, now I want to talk about FMEA, and um, let's see. So we'll just draw it on here for just a second. I think this starts on slide number 31 in week seven. FMEA, and it stands for some gobbledygook. Uh, I think it's failure mode, I think, I know. It's failure modes and effects analysis. Did that clear everything up for everybody? <laughs> Silliness. Okay, what is it? It's a risk matrix. That's what it is. It's a risk matrix. Simple as that. So... <clears throat> Um, uh, one of the things that uh, it, 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 that uh, can be very, very helpful, and one of the things that plagues a lot of companies, I think we were talking about when we make the business case, I don't know if it was, I don't know if I emphasize this too much, but when we're making a business case, I often advise people to focus on a couple of different things. One is revenue, right? This is going to help us inc increase revenue. Number two is margin. This is going to make us more profitable, right, by reducing cost or something like that. And the third is reducing risk. Uh, I'll just write risk. But this one, um, while everybody agrees reducing risk can sometimes be extremely valuable, if you're in a hospital and you reduce the risk of a power outage from 1% uh, to a tenth of 1%, that's huge. You might save lives. Or if you're in an IT department and you're reducing the risk of uh, a project not being completed on time from, uh, okay, I'm going to be a realist here, from 50% to 20%, that's huge. that can be huge. Um, the problem is people don't handle, people don't um, usually measure risks very well and they don't, uh, and they don't, they're not very rational when it comes to risk. So this is a tool that's going to help us or help you um, rationalize risk, maybe measure risk, um, and mitigate risk. Um, that's what this is all about. Now, it's interesting to me that one of the first uses I ever had of this tool was at an insurance company, and it was with, um, it was with a, uh, an IT department, and <laughs> I had people telling me that I couldn't measure risk, and I said, Really? I, I, you know, I can take you down to the actuarial department and they'll tell me otherwise. I mean, that's what our whole business is based on, is measuring and understanding risk. So there's, there can be some pushback to this. But um, anyway, here's the basics, and then we can maybe go into, um, um, well, I'll tell you what, why don't we, uh, yeah, we can go into, um, well, before we get to the basics, I'm going to give you, one of the things that we're not rational about. And this is a true story, okay? So, with all this talk about plane crashes, this is supposed to be F Florida, there's Maine, there's Michigan. Ugh, it's a terrible drawing. That's supposed to be the United States, okay? I'm not going to draw Europe. <laughs> but anyway, um, I have a sister, and this is, I, I still have this sister, but, and this is my drawing of a plane, so you know how, how this is going. Um, she used to be a uh, flight attendant, and she was an international flight attendant. She had a great job. She loved her job. She's now a language uh, teacher. Um, she loved her job, but she quit her job. And I, this is not a fake story. This is true. Now, she may have embellished it for me, but she really said this. She literally said this. She quit. Uh, well, why do you think she quit? Any thoughts or uh, ideas why she would have quit? Wanted to be home more. Yeah, well, that's a good that's a good one. No, she quit quit because it was a risky job. Well, what was she? She was afraid of something. What was she afraid of? She's flying all the time. She's flying all the time. Terrorism. 
Yeah, well, she you would have think she would be afraid of stuff like that. You'd think she may be afraid of, I go to a foreign city or I go to a, a foreign country and I'm not inoculated, I get a disease or I get, um, uh, you know, I get robbed. No, she was afraid of the plane crashing in the ocean. But not just that, she was afraid of the plane crashing in the ocean. She would somehow survive and one of these guys would come by and uh, and eat her. So in other words, she was afraid. And I'm not kidding you. She was not afraid of crashing. She was not afraid afraid of a lot of other terrorism. Uh, this was pre 9/11. Uh, she was afraid of crashing in the ocean, somehow surviving, and getting eaten by the shark, or by a shark. Now, uh, what's ridiculous about that? Where do you start, right? <laughs> I mean, it's my sister. I love her to death, but this is just ridiculous. It's kind of like what is what is the movie uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, where they're both standing by the 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 cliff, and the one guy says, um, "We have to jump," and they're going to jump into this river, and the other guy says, "I don't want to jump. I can't swim." And he looks over. And he says, "Are you an idiot? The fall's going to kill you." Um, it's it's the same thought, right? I mean, the risk of that, the likelihood of that is so, so small. But what she's doing in her brain is she's escalating the severity of that risk to, a, to an extreme degree, such that it blots out everything else. She's only seeing one dimension of risk, and that's how severe the risk is. Now, I know that's a crazy example, but do we have examples of that? You don't have to pull them out. But we have examples of that in our own businesses where you think maybe we overestimate the risks of some things and underestimate the risks of other things. And it's generally the things that we overestimate are the catastrophic things. And the things that we underestimate are the things that are moderately serious but very likely to occur. Um, so an FMEA attempts to regulate that by looking at it in the following way. It takes a risk, whatever that risk is. We will take a process, okay, and we'll do an example in just a second. We'll take a process, whatever that process is, and we'll list the risks. You know, one, two, three, four, five, whatever. We'll, risk, we'll list the effects of that risk. Like, for example, uh, we're going to cover uh, cooking a pizza. Cooking a pizza. Okay, if you're a pizza parlor, uh, what are some risks that are, uh, what's one, what, what's just one risk, uh, I, I, you know what, I'll just write it down. One risk might be, I burn the pizza, right, I could burn that pizza. The effect of that might be, I have to throw the pizza out, but I could also have another effect. Maybe I could also have a, mm, I serve a burnt pizza. Like if it's not that burnt that badly, maybe there's some risk of the customer uh, being unhappy with that. Does that make sense? So there can be more than one effect for a risk. I should have I shouldn't have numbered all these right away. Another thing that could happen is the cook uh, injures self. Um, an effect might be cook dies or cook loses arm, loses finger. Let's, let's, I'm making it less catastrophic. That would be a really bad one. Or another one might be, or burns pretty bad. Or another uh, one would be, Cook has a boo-boo. <laughs> a little tiny, you know, a, a tiny, a tiny uh, injury. Uh, those two things are very different in their effects. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So for each of these effects, then, what I'm going to do is I'm going to score it on three things. I'm going to score it on how severe it is. We call that severity. I'm going to score it on how likely it is. I call that occurrence. Let's see if I can spell that right. OCC, just so that we know that. And I score it on uh, 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 detection. I'll get to this one in a second, but I like to think of this on as business control. Okay? So I score it on severity, 
I scored on occurrence, and I scored on business control. So we'll come back to this in a second, but I want to show, we'll come back to this particular example, but I want to now put this all in context so that we, we get the whole thing, like where would I use an FMEA? Where would, uh, uh, where would this be helpful? What are the things that I want to bring in uh, before I do this and all the rest? So let's take a moment to uh, do that. I'm going to open up my, my PowerPoint. This is week seven. I'm going to open it up to slide 31. And we'll begin there. So failure modes and effects analysis. OK. Um, so we're going to actually build that one that we just started. Um, but the idea is we're going to identify and prioritize the risk of failure, right? OK? And uh, we'll build this FMEA uh, matrix. And we'll start to think about how we can manage these risks and mitigate them. OK. And FMEA can be used a lot of different places. It can be, certainly be used in analyze. It can be used in improve. It can be used in control. Um, I'm going to also circula, uh, circle um, circle this. It can be used in uh, right here uh, or right here. Um, I recently used an FMEA to create a measurement because one of the things that we're going to find is that we can actually measure risk using an FMEA. And so you can create measurements for that, and you can baseline those measurements. So that's another place where you can use it. Um, all different places where you can use it. Now, um, uh, here is a particularly important thing. And uh, in the example that we'll do is just a uh, in just a second, we'll cover this. So when do you use an FMEA? We sort of already covered that, like in the improved step or in the control step. But this is what I want to circle. An FMEA is a heavy lifting tool. So it shouldn't be the first tool you use. Um, you should definitely, if you, if you haven't done a process map yet, you should do that. Uh, if you haven't used the basic team tools like brainstorming or fishbone or affinity diagram, you should do that. <clears throat> um, if you haven't done an input-output diagram, sometimes that's very helpful uh, before you do an FMEA um, and so forth. So do the simpler tools first that we've already covered. FMEA is a little bit heavier lifting. OK. So let's see. Uh, let me go back here. Um, and, uh, and, you know, this is basically how it works. If you think about the funnel, it's when you have uh, a lot fewer key inputs and key outputs, um, than, or key inputs, um, than you did when you started. So if you're starting with 30 or 50, that's sort of brainstorm time. Uh, Multi-voting might get you down to 8 or 10 or even 4 to 8. That's the time to use an FMEA when things are pretty well structured. Or another way of looking at it is, um, I'm going to go to here, uh, another time to use M an FMEA is let's suppose you have a process that's got, w w will be, be as simple as possible here, that's got four steps. You know. You probably just wouldn't start out on an FMEA on this. You'd probably wait till you say, OK, we've got a real problem here, and there's a lot of risks right there. I'm going to put an FMEA on that one. So be pretty targeted about your FMEAs, because they can get so out of control. Um, uh, now, if you're Ford Motor Company, and you do an FMEA on your cars, or your Toyota, and you do it on your cars, which they all do, um, you might have thousands of entries into an FMEA. If we're on a process improvement team, we, don't, we can't afford to take that much time. So if we have like 20 or 30 entries on an FMEA, 20 or 30 risks, that's more than enough. Um, that's more than enough. All making some sense? All right. Um, so uh, let's, uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, and yes, there's uh, different types. There are product and service. There's process and there's project. We're going to be focusing on the one for project, but they all work exactly the same. Uh, they all work exactly the same. Now, you have a template. I'm just going to show you the template. Uh, I thought I was going to show you the template. I will show you the template. Uh, let's see. We'll look in here, and we'll just put it in your downloads here. OK, in your templates directory. There is a template for FMEA, 
And it's going to look complicated, but we're actually going to go through it. In the book, there's also a very slowly going through the FMEA example, uh, but we're going to do it as simply as possible um, in our, uh, just kind of on a whiteboard, if you will. So let's start out with that. But there is a template here, and, and uh, if you fill it in, um, like for example, we're going to fill in a severity and an occurrence and a, and a detection, and it comes up with a number called the RPN score, and um, that's the way that we uh, that's the way that we're going to calculate this. The product of all of these three things is going to tell us the overall risk. Okay, but let's go back to uh, let's go back to our regularly scheduled program and do the example. Okay, so we're going to get to this in just a second, this pizza one. Um, but before we do, I said it's good to have a few different things uh, going on before we do the FMEA. So let's, let's put ourselves in the, let's suppose we wanted to improve the, uh, the defect rate in a pizza place. Let's say we own the pizza place or whatever. And our process, our high-level process was take the order, cook, uh, box, deliver, and uh, process payment. Okay? Those are our process steps. I'm sure we could make it more complicated, but let's suppose that we did that. And let's say that we found out that the number one area, the number one concern for the customers was burnt pizzas. Okay. And <clears throat> let's say that this was the area that we wanted to focus on. We found out through some preliminary data or maybe a brainstorming session that this is where we want to focus. So we're going to focus on the, the area of cooking. So cooking the pizza. And uh, so let's start by drawing the input-output dra diagram. So this, if this is cooking the pizza, uh, what are some of the inputs um, that are coming? Uh, and, and remember, we're, we're thinking about uh, defective pizzas, right? We want that to be very small, but that's maybe a thing that we could measure. What would be some things that are inputs to this? Time in the oven. Okay, yep. Uh, time in oven. Why don't we just say uh, cooking process? I'm, I'm just going to try and you know, make that uh, uh, pick. We also need the oven, right? We need the oven and some other equipment. Some other equipment. Staff. Staff? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What else? Ingredients. Ingredients. Mm-hmm. What else? You need an order. I need the orders. If I want to make a pineapple pizza, I need to know the orders. <laughs> I need to know if somebody ordered it. Anything else? Okay. We could go on and on and on and on and on about this, but essentially maybe we need training for the cooks or whatever. So we need a cooking process or recipes. We need an oven. We need staff. We need ingredients. We need orders. We could we could go on like this, um, but I, at this point I'm going to um, I'm going to cut us off and just say I think this is enough for our purposes, and I'll just come back to say um, afterward why was this helpful or wasn't it helpful or how could it be why did we do this? Um, it's evident, I hope it's evident right here, that what I'm doing is I'm trying to define what the problem is here, and I'm trying to say, I'm trying to limit the scope of what I'm looking at, because to do an FMEA, remember, I don't want to have a giant scope. Okay, so now let's go to the tail of the tape. So we're cooking a pizza. It's the cooking process, right? It's just that process step. <clears throat> and uh, we, we're creating defective pizzas. What are the... Uh, what are the risks in that? Uh, what are the risks in that cooking process? Let's just list a few. Let's just go around the room. What's a, what's a risk in cooking a pizza? Uh, let me start with uh, Mike. Are you on? Yeah, uh, temperature 
you're being too high? Temp too high. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, Tammy, what's the risk? Made wrong? Uh, made incorrectly. Okay, I put the cheese on after I put on the sauce or whatever, or before I put on the sauce. Or I spun it after I put on all the ingredients. Okay, uh, let's see, Steve? Um, a timer defect, uh, the, the clock for how long you keep it in there. Okay, so a, t a timer defect. That works. Uh, John? Too busy. Too many orders. Too busy. And uh, Gina? I was going to say that there was a defect with the oven, but that might fit in more with Steve's number three or Mike's number one. Okay. Um, let's just put it down there anyway. Okay. Okay, and we'll see how this all kind of works out in the wash. I hope we'll see how it works out in the wash. All right, so let's start with the, <coughs> let's list some of the effects here to see if we need to break it up or not. What would be some of the effects of the temperature being too high? What could happen? This is the risk, right? What are the effects? Burn it. I could burn it. Okay. That's probably the only one I really care about right there. Um, okay, how about making it incorrectly? What's the effect of that? Unhappy customer. Mm hmm. Or you I can get, make I get the, sick. Yeah, maybe we could be uh, more specific. We get we get the wrong pe wrong pizza made. Right? Is that is that what you're talking about, Tammy? Yeah, or you have to throw it away. It's waste. Waste. Okay. All right. Um, uh, I'm going to say burn major and burn minor here. Okay, how about the timer defect? Uh, could be the same thing, right? Uh, too busy. That could be burn off. You could burn it. It's too busy. Okay. And uh, how how about the broken oven? Um, that could be burn if it's running. It says it's running at 350 and it's really running at 450. Yep. Or the opposite. It could be undercooked. Could be raw. Uh huh. Right. Okay. Good. So <clears throat> so um. Okay, good. I'm going to add one more thing in here. Oh, geez, I haven't left myself uh, too much room. Uh, if it's okay, John, I hope you won't be too hurt if I remove too busy. That's okay, Mark. It's a good one, <laughs> but I'm going to add in one here just to illustrate a point. So I wanted to add in here uh, cook, cook uh, burns self. Okay. Um, and uh, j just so that we can put this in context, because those are real risks as well, and those are some of the things that we're looking at. Um, and we can put in major burn, major burns, and minor. Okay. Now, for each one of these effects, uh, what we'll want to do then is let's start out by saying, how severe is it? Um, so if the temperature is too high, and I burn this, and, but I burn it, uh, this is a, I, I put sell there. In other words, I burn it so I can still sell the pizza. Um, yeah, I mean, this is kind of like, uh, this is minor. Here, it's basically just major, you know, a minor customer is a little bit unhappy. So here I want to put in a number from 1 to 10, um, where 10 is the most severe, 1 is the least severe. Uh, where might you put that? Here's the trick for getting the first one down. You just got to pick a number and put it down. And then all the others will flow from it. All the others will be relative to it. So a minor burn, we might put that at a severity of, I don't know. I can still four? sell. Yeah, I can still sell the pizza. Maybe a four is fine. I'll put down a four. Uh, burn it major. Now, this is, again, the pizza. 
I burn the pizza and it's a major burn. I have I probably have to throw this out, or uh, I'm really going to get on the happy customer. That's going to be more severe, right? Where do you want to put that? Nine or a ten. Okay. So if we put a ten, let me just put where if the cook burns himself and has to go to the hospital, where are we going to put that? Are we going to put that above burning the pizza and serving a customer a burnt pizza? Yeah. So we need to leave a little bit of room. And that's it's okay if you put a 10 there, but as we go down, we'll find out things like that. Um, Maybe like a 7? Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. 7's good. Oh, hello. What happened? Let's put a 7 there. Uh, and, and we can kind of, you know, quick quickly go down here. Uh, made the pizza incorrectly. That means the wrong pizza is made and I gotta throw it out. That's probably on the order of this, maybe not quite as bad, but close, right? Maybe a six. Uh, time or defect, again, this would be either major or minor. It's really the same one as this, so we've got a four and we've got a seven. I'm keeping these separate for a reason and you'll see why in just a second. The cook burns himself, major burns, that's a 10. Right? Minor burns, that might be a, I don't know, maybe it's a five. Uh, broken oven, again, if it burns, this could be like a seven, raw, about the same. Okay, now I went really quickly, and uh, I'll show you in just a moment um, some suggested scales. But the important thing when you're first doing it or when you're doing it with a team is just really to get, huh, after I went through this whole thing about saying rate it, don't rank it, what we're really doing here is we're getting relative numbers, right? So we're really ranking these uh, these things. Uh, if we're not talking about people, I think we're doing okay, but um, there are ways to tighten that up. All right, the next thing that we're going to do is occurrence. So the things that are more likely are going to have high numbers. The things that are less likely are going to have low numbers. So, um, and this is one of the reasons why I left this here um, and I separated these out. One of the reasons is because we can do an and statement, and it helps us understand um, the likelihood of this being of this occurring. So, what is the likelihood that the temperature is too high and I burn the pizza? You see what's going on there. So, that separates out this burn from this burn. If that makes sense, what's the probability they made it incorrectly and a wrong pizza end up being made? Well. Those are pretty much the same. What's the probability that the cook burns himself and then ends up being a minor, a major burn? What's the probability that if I have a, that I have a broken oven and I burn the pizza? So it's bringing in that risk in there. So I'm just going to fill this in, but you'll see what's you'll, you'll basically see what's going on. This might be a seven, and this might be a two. Uh, this might be uh, let's say that we have a really good point of service system. Maybe this is a two. Uh, timer defect, uh, very similar to broken oven, so I'm not going to fill out both of them anymore. I will put a, uh, let's say we have problems with our ovens, they're old ovens, and our cooks burn themselves all the time, but they, they're not getting major burns. They're getting uh, these sorts of burns. I'm not going to talk about the last one. We'll call this broken oven, too. Okay. Um, the last one detection or business control is the amount of current process that we have in place to detect something before it happens and prevent the issue, right? So to prevent the risk from becoming an issue. Um, so let me just give you an example. If we had like a really clear and accurate thermometer that we could, that we stuck, uh, that we had in that oven that we always read beforehand, this would be a very good number here for our risk. If we didn't have any process or any statistical process control or anything like that, um, that would be a very bad number. Now the way that these are set up is that for each one of these, severity, occurrence, and detection, 1 equals great, 10 equals bad. Okay, 10 equals bad. So let's suppose that we didn't have any business controls at all on the temperature, and the temperature being too high. Oh, I guess we had the, the thermostat on the oven, so that might be uh, what? 
That might be a, let's just nominally set that at a five. And, and let's b make both of these a five. Um, let's say on this one we had uh, uh, a really good um, process. Like I said, we have a really good point of service process so that we have a, a, a good check with the customer that goes back and says, is this your right pizza? Okay, so we do a real good job here. Um, would that make the detection high or low? Should I put a 10 there or should I put a 1 there? Or a 2 or a 9? You're claiming it's good, so I say a 1. I'm claiming it's good. What's a good number to put here? Right, right, low okay, number. Good. good. So a really good number, a, a great number here would be a 1. A bad number is a 10. I'm, I'm spending some time talking about this because I always get it wrong and, and lots of people get this wrong. They put in a 10 because they think a 10 is better than a, a 1. Don't ask me why and why here in detection people get it that way, but just watch yourself on that one. Low numbers are good, high numbers are bad. Uh, are high numbers, high risk. Okay, let's say on this, on this one, on the other hand, there is, uh, we don't have any preventive maintenance and we don't really check the ovens and there's nothing going on there. Our detection here might be like a 9 or a 10. And, uh, and for both of these, right? Um, and then uh, for this one with major burns, uh, let's say that, they, that the cooks do get some training, so maybe this is, these are threes, uh, etc. Or, uh, you know, so forth. Um, okay, so once we come up with all these, we can calculate an RPN. I'm just going to do this quickly in our head. And an RPN is S times O times D. Okay, so it's a multiply, it multiplies these. Okay, so let's see, I, ch I chose rather unwisely here. <laughs> 140. That's 140? Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 140. 70. Uh, this is 70. Uh, this is 1224. This is, let's see, 9 times 9 is 81, right? Oh, uh, no, it's 9 times 20. 180. 180. 180, and this one is a little bit, this one is a little bit higher. This one is, uh, like, what is it, 3 something. 7 times 5, 5 times 9 is 45, 4, 45 times 7, no. 35 times 9, 35 times 10 is 350, 350. so this is 315. Okay, and then major burns, that's 30. This is 15 times 3, that's 45. And this one is off the table now. All right, so this would help us understand, you know, what are the ones that we really want to mitigate, and this one is all pointing to. Um, these are the ones that we want to focus on first. Um, the uh, the timer defects and the, the broken ovens. Now, we just made up this whole story, right? And a lot of it is driven by we don't have any business controls on it. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, so what might be an improvement, a, a way that we would help improve uh, this particular, what might be a way that we could improve this particular process or, or reduce the de defects? What, what leaps to mind once we look at this? Okay, I, I'll be students okay. able. I, I, how about buy new ovens? That might help, right? Okay, what else? You, uh, surely you can come up with better ideas than that. Periodic testing of the timer. Yeah, I love it. Periodic testing of the timer or the broken oven. You know, make sure that everything's okay. Um, maybe there's different days, uh, different checks that you do during a day, a five-point checklist or whatever. Um, and that can help reduce uh, this risk a lot. Okay. Makes sense kind of how it goes? All right. Well, I'm going to assume, yeah. I didn't get any response there, but I'm going to assume that's a yes. And um, I just want to, now we can go back to here, and what's complicated about this one, we just covered the left-hand side of this. And you can see on the right-hand side, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger, um, you can see on the right-hand side, this is sort of like a before and after. So we might have calculated all these things on the left-hand side, and now we have some recommended actions that we would, that we would go through 
um, and, uh, and see if that reduced the risk at all. Okay? Now, there's some good and bad about all these things. Before I go into that, I want to show you that there are, I do have some tables on these tabs here in your, in your template um, where I have a tab for severity. So here's, um, and this is just a guideline, by the way. You don't have to use this 100%. But here's a guideline on what we might put the severity at. Um, tens or nines are always like, we could get sued, we could lose a major customer, somebody could die. Those are tens or nines. <coughs> All right, um, and then ones or twos are always things like mm, customer doesn't even notice it. There's no loss really at all, or maybe there's a minor effect on the performance. Um, occurrence is a difficult one. I put in here one that might work for you, but it might not. Like uh, this would be maybe at a high volume manufacturing company, maybe one in two million is reasonable. At your company, maybe you have to talk about a different scale. Uh, all right, but uh, it's good to talk about what those scales are beforehand, something I did not do with this group. Um, uh, but I, I, I didn't want to inundate us with, uh, you know, too much before we went, we went forward. Uh, it might help to just start uh, by saying, um, um, you know, on your group to say, let's suppose we're looking at loan applications or defects in loan applications. You might say, um, uh, Regina, you might say, well, you know, if it's one in 500, that would be that would be a one. And if it's, uh, but on the other hand, if it's one in 100, uh, that might be a three. And if it's one in, uh, if it's one in 50, that might be a five. It, if it's a, <clears throat> and, and a 10 might be, geez, it, it happens, you know, 50% of the time or almost all the time. Um, and that would help people gauge, you know, what those numbers should be. Detection, the same sort of thing. Uh, we can see uh, at the bottom, defects is obvious and it's always caught. It's never passed to the customer. And a 10 is it's caused by failure that's not detectable. It just knocked us from nowhere. So that's what's going on there. <coughs> so I'm going to pause for just a second. And I'm going to ask you, um, um, what? Uh, actually, no, I'm going to go through a couple of do's and don'ts first. So, um, and I'm back in the, and like I said, this, the, the whole gory process is shown here where everything's being filled out uh, and so forth. Some do's and don'ts when you're doing an FMEA. Do use an FMEA only on a specific part of a process that keeps it targeted. I can't tell you how it, out of hand it can get if you let the session go on to a large part of the process. Do create your own scales. Um, if you want to do 0 to 5 or 1 to 5, that's totally okay. <coughs> Not a problem at all. If we were the auto companies, we would have those fixed and everybody would have to use the same ones, but we're not. <laughs> so we don't have to be, you know, slaves to that. Um, do use other tools to, <coughs> excuse me, to as inputs to the FMEA. Um, so we use, for example, the process map and the input-output diagram. How did the input-output diagram help us there? Or what were some things that the input-output diagram helped us with, with the FMEA? Just identify input, put, go ahead, Mike. I think it helps us identify parts of the process or things that might be a driver. Yep, exactly. That, that number one is they can help you identify things that can go wrong. So <clears throat> one of the things that was an input was staff. Um, uh, the st and, and maybe this was obvious to everybody, but the staff burning themselves, um, that's a risk um, that probably that may not have come up if we didn't list that out. Or getting the order wrong might not have happened if we didn't list that out. So that's number one. <clears throat> number two, and this is more subtle, uh, is that it can help you understand the occurrence uh, b better. It can help you understand why certain risks happen and therefore can help you understand the proportional, like how often, how likely is something to happen because it starts, as Mike said, it starts to get you to think about the drivers for those risks and so that can help you understand the likelihoods. Um, so both of those things are good. Um, <coughs> now, the, uh, the last thing I wanted to point out is that FMEAs are living documents. 
Um, when you first start out and do an FMEA, it's really not very objective, is it? I mean, we're putting some objectivity on it, but we're not being super objective. We're saying, oh, here's what a 5 is, here's basically what a 7 is. You can make them better over time by uh, using data, but that's also a barrier in the beginning. Because if people want to make them super duper, you know, high power FMEAs and they start out with putting data on it, they can get bogged down. So, um, so uh, do be tactical about it, keep it short and sweet, um, and so forth. Now, what, what you don't want to do is spend a ton of time arguing over something should be a 5 or a 6 or whatever. <coughs> um, when in doubt, um, if you're facilitating, pick one and move on. Um, if you're doing it for your process, do not do it alone in your, in your cubicle, just like a process map. Um, and do spend some time um, talking to people about what they're doing. <laughs> about the, you know, maybe spend some time brainstorming those risks and multi-voting. Um, that's often a really great uh, way to do it. And, um, and then you can score those risks. I think most people kind of get the first two pretty simply. How severe is it and, um, and uh, how likely is it to occur? The third one is not as clear, but I think if you, and I wish they wouldn't have named it detection. Uh, detection, it, 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 it makes me think of other things. But if you put on business controls, not only can I, do I have some measurement or am I, do I have some control of this, um, or am I measuring it or am I monitoring it, but I have some control over the outcome. The more control over the outcome, the better and the higher, or the lower, see I did it, the lower that detection number is going to be. Um, so, um, um, so I, at this point, I'm just going to um, stop and I'm going to ask you, you know, what, what questions do you have about, uh, about uh, FMEA before we, before we, I ask a couple of questions to you. <laughs> I'll put up our finished, beautiful FMEA before we move on. So what questions do you have about this? Mark, this is Steve. Uh, yeah? Is there a limit? Uh, uh, some guideline of the number of people who should participate in the FMEA, or should the uh, should the focus be more on getting some cross-functional uh, members? Well, um, <clears throat> I think that's a good question. It depends on the size and scope of your FMEA. So I'm I've been advocating in here that you want to do it on a very targeted area of the process. So that those are the people that you want primarily. So if you're doing it right in that process, you want to have people who are in that process or people who touch that process. Um, in the example with the pizza, you'd probably want to have the cooks. You'd probably want to have people who transmit the orders, and you probably yeah. want to have the delivery, I was going to say delivery boys, but that's sexist. Uh, so delivery people <laughs> um, right. in the room. So essentially you'd want a representative from each of these um, areas. Yeah, and, and in the key area, maybe a couple. Yeah. You probably want a couple of cooks. Yep, good question. Good question. Okay. What other questions do you have? Mark, can you go to the uh, template where we're talking about the right side? You bet. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so recommended actions. Okay. So, looking at the, like a recommended action, maybe there's a recommended action that we truly don't know what those effects would be. You would use the columns N, O, P and, uh, to figure that out? So, <clears throat> um, Right, right. So, so for example, let's 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 put in. Um, um, and and by the way, this is where I think a lot of statisticians have major problems with this. I'm going to give an example where statisticians have major problems. In classical statistics, this detection thing is irrelevant. We don't talk about that. We talk about risk being the product being to, between severity and occurrence. But. Uh, 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 that notwithstanding, and I'll tell you why I said that at the very end, but right now, uh, let's go through the example that we just did, right? So this is our process step is cooking. I'm, I'll just fill it out like it was, right? So what's the potential failure mode? The oven is broken. 
the fact of the pay, the failure is I burned the pizza. How severe is that? It was a, I said it was a five. Uh, potential cause, well, it's a broken oven. Oven, current controls, none. And that's, that's what's motivating these different things. So what uh, I, I said, what, uh, what might be, uh, I think we said the recommended action might be periodic monitoring. I think you even said that, right? Um, so who's responsible? I'm going to say it's Regina. <laughs> and um, um, so uh, uh, let's say uh, monitoring process, uh, let's see, oven monitoring process created. Okay, now, um, now we would simply rescore it, right? So, does this do anything to the severity of a burnt pizza? No, is the is the answer. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna skip occurrence for just a second. Does it do anything to our controls? Well, yes, it definitely makes our controls better, right? So, I don't know whether it moves it to five or whatever, but we would have some definition of what control means. Let's take a look at it actually. So it's not detectable. Uh, occasional units checks for defects. Unit sample inspected. It's kind of like around a five, right? It's like statistical monitoring or something like that. SBC with immediate action about maybe it's this, maybe it's a five or a four, but in any event, it's not a ten, it's not a one. Um, so let's just uh, let's just put in a uh, five. Okay, now occurrence should that stay the same or did it change? And this is where classical stati statisticians get angry because. All you really did with putting in the detection, I think a lot of people would argue, is you changed the likelihood that this was going to occur. Um, and so why are we doing both? Well, the answer is, because I think, is because a lot of people, including myself, uh, find this idea of explicitly putting in what business controls do we have on this and offering that as a, uh, as a potential uh, way of mitigating the risk is is uh, is off, it's often a very strong way of mitigating risk. So I don't know if this moves it to a five or whatever, uh, but I'm, I'll put in a five there, and so uh, we'd be able to get a new RPN. If you had data, that would be even better, right? If you went out and you actually said, "Well, I can't do anything about the detection," <coughs> about the detection, severity should stay the same. There's no reason it should change. Detection is kind of definition, but we could measure occurrence, right? We could look at, okay, let's measure 100 pizzas and see where it came on the scale, and then we'll fill in our number. So we could do that. Did that work? Yes. Okay. Okay. So it, 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 it's, <clears throat> in some ways, it's still hand-waving, but it's a little bit better than hand-waving on some of these things, particularly in currents. We could get data. Uh, to do this. Okay. Um, what might be some issues with uh, doing, if you wanted to do a FMEA, what would be some things you'd look out for um, if you were going to do it? Definitely one of those things that if you're going to do it with the team, make sure they have plenty of time, probably more time than what we've done, uh, to go through this, or you can simplify it, right? I tried not to talk about, you know, the, the use language like failure mode or things like that. Um, so <clears throat> I often don't like to do it with the, with the template. I'll often do it on a whiteboard or something like that with people um, just so that, you know, get them grounded on, hey, we're talking about risks, things that could go wrong, uh, how severe is this, 1 to 10, and you can draw things out. I give people ample time to talk about it. Okay, watch out for that detection. Uh, make sure that one is good and ten is bad. Okay, um, I'm going to move on .org then. And uh, uh, we did talk about pr uh, using an FMEA for prioritizing risks. That w that's what it is. And I think you know how to build an FMEA. Um, may not be totally competent, uh, confident uh, in doing it, but uh, if you have any questions, you know, give me a call and, and talk through it. Um, all right, um, now it's your turn. Take a few minutes to write down what are your key takeaways, and then I will go into measurement systems analysis.
You know, this is everybody's favorite. And I'm actually going to get a drink so I don't cough as much. So I'll be right back. All right, so now I want to talk about measurement systems, and um, and uh, we're going to skip this section on Decision Guru. Um, if you want to know more about this, it's a really cool tool, but I don't want this to be like a straight line commercial, so um, I'm not going to go into that. Can you use it in Six Sigma? Absolutely. Can you use it in general business? Absolutely. Um, so I'll be happy to talk to you on that one-on-one, -on -one, but I don't want to force us down this, uh, down this path. You can read it. There's a video um, <coughs> on it. Um, a nice alternative to doing um, FMEA, much more visual. Um, in any event, uh, we're going to skip past this. We're going to go to uh, measurement systems, see if I can get there. So it's 84, I think, starting on 84. There it is right there. Okay, and like I said... Um, Measurement systems analysis, I, I want to put this in context. So uh, measurement systems analysis, it can happen a lot of different places, but it most often, often happens here. Why the heck, then, are we covering this at the end of the course instead of at the beginning? There's two different reasons, but the, 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 there's a um, sort of a practical, there's a, a, a real tactical reason and it's going to sound weird, but one of the main things, just like with that preventive maintenance that we talked about, um, uh, one, of the, one of the things that you often will do is at the end of a process change or something like that, if measuring things or if monitoring things, <coughs> I've worked with a lot of QA departments, and um, uh, sometimes at the end of a project that we'll work out, uh, we don't just find uh, errors, but we want to make sure that the people who are finding errors are are finding them correctly as well. So we're measuring the measurers. Um, and that often, we can set up procedures for doing that often very well in the control phase. So that's sort of the, um, well, let me be frank, the BS reason for putting it here. Um, the real reason is because it involves two things in classical statistics, hypothesis tests and DOE. And we weren't ready to cover it back then. Um, but measurement systems analysis can be very helpful in doing this, um, and uh, or it can be very it can be very helpful. Uh, just think about it very high level. One of the reasons why we're talking about doing uh, design for I'm sorry um, Six Sigma is we're trying to make more fact based and data based uh, decisions, more data driven decisions. Um, Oh, those data-driven de decisions are no good. It's not going to help us to use data-driven decisions if our data isn't good either. And so, um, this, 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 uh, in, in this section, what we're going to do is we're going to look into, um, we're going to look into how do we, how do we tactically do this, okay? And uh, a lot of this section in the book is how do we analyze it. I don't think we need to go into that because I'll show you. It's actually pretty straightforward. Um, we'll just do an example or two, and um, I think we'll be fully satisfied that we can do this. All right. Um, the important thing is to recognize the settings. So, um, so let's kind of go into that. Um, oh, also, before we get into that, I wanted to... Um, let's see if I can do it on this. So, once upon a time, I promise you don't have to learn manufacturing to do this. Uh, I used to make optical amplifiers, and one of the things that we measured 
that was important to our customers was noise. One of the bad things about an amplifier is it's noisy. So low noise amplifiers are very good. Um, so our customers were customers like Lucent and, and uh, Lucent Technologies and Cisco and all that. They cared about something that, that was noise, that called noise figure. The only thing you need to know about this is low numbers is good, low noise is good, and high noise is bad. I won't write that out. <clears throat> okay? So we had, uh, and I'm going to make this up a bit, we had a, a process where, and I'm making this up, let's say a noise figure of three was, was really bad, and this meant that we couldn't ship to customers. Uh, one of the things that we were always doing was trying to build low noise amplifiers. So one of the problems with, that we had was they're hard to build. So this was the, if I took a specific amplifier and looked at it, and I were baselining my process and I were cal calculating capability, all this stuff is bad, right? Let's say that was, again, I'm just making this up, but let's say it was about 30%. That's not too far off. So it turned out that this was a major problem that we had. 30% of the amplifiers, at least for a certain line that we were making, were not cutting it in the noise figure. Now, there wasn't much that we could do about it. We could rework these a little bit, but for the most part, we scrapped them. Now, the interesting thing is, now I was called in uh, to run a team to do this, and uh, we, didn't know six, we didn't do Six Sigma back then. I guess we knew it, but uh, um, uh, we weren't trained in Six Sigma at this time, so we just used good old engineering. And after much deliberation we ascent and much observation, we found that um, what was going on there was that it was the measurement system that was the problem. Um, in other words, we were measuring, no a lot of the times when we were measuring things over here, they really weren't over here. They were really somewhere else. Um, and so what we did was we fixed up the, our, our project then was to fix up the measurement system. Now, it didn't have to be this way. It was a happy story. But when we fixed up the measurement system, we found that the true state of affairs was more like this. It was more like uh, 7%. Um, so the, the answer was, and, and this is real. This had a real effect. We no longer reworked or scrapped 30%. We really reworked or scrapped 7%. Now, we didn't make any changes whatsoever to the process of how an amplifier was made. We made no changes to the amplifier at all. All we changed was how it was measuring. And you want to know our secret? <laughs> our secret was we measured it three times and took the average. Okay? And that's what we did. When we measured three times and took the average, we found that we got a much truer picture of what the noise figure really was. There were all sorts of reasons for why it was out here. I'm not going to get into that. But this was a very short project and ended up being about two months and netted about five million bucks. Now, and that was big money for Corning. Uh, might not be bu big money for some companies, but that was, that was big money for us. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, fast forward a little bit later to, um, to a company called Cigna that I worked at. I was a consultant there and one of my black belts uh, looked into performance guarantees, and performance guarantees are like specifications. So they were guaranteeing a certain level of performance for a customer, and they looked at their performance, and it looked about like this. This was for customer service, and so they were reimbursing the customer for all sorts of work that was out here. Bottom line is they looked into the measurement system, and it turned out that on almost all of this, they were meeting the performance guarantees, and so they went from a tremendous amount of money annually to paying out very little. Um, um, and uh, a lot of water went under the bridge here. They had to convince the customer that this was indeed the case. Um, but the bottom line for this is measurement systems, measurements matter. Now, it just as well could have been the other way for, for our noise figure uh, example. It could have been, it could have been, whoops, uh, I'll just use this one. It could have been that we thought it was like this, we thought it was 30%, but it actually was worse. It was actually 45%. In either case, that's really bad because the, the problem that, we're ha that we had with a lot of these things that were in sort of the gray, what we call the gray area is that we just didn't know. Uh, we didn't know whether they belonged to the good modules or the bad things. So we, we had two risks. We were either paying unnecessarily for them 
or we were giving the customer something that was unacceptable. Both of them are bad risks. Okay, so uh, the measurement systems, uh, a lot of money. Um, all right, so it behooves us to take a look. Okay, back to the regularly scheduled program, but not for long because we're going to be talking about, so there will be a few things I'll talk about in general here. Um, and after we complete this module, remember, we're not going to go through all the slides here. No way. No way, no how. Uh, we'll explain MSA and its importance. And I think you basically got the, the, the importance of it. Hopefully you feel that and you understand that that's real. Um, we'll be able to also state the difference when we finish this between accuracy and precision and describe the components of measurement systems variation and perform something called a gauge R&R. What I want to do <coughs> is impress upon you that I'm not, oh, come on, I'm not all that interested in saying, hey, you need to do a gauge R&R &R analysis. What I want us to just do is to do a measurement systems MS, MSA. We're just going to perform an MSA. And what does that mean? <coughs> well, uh, we're going to find out, <laughs> okay? So an MS, what, what an MSA is and so forth. So here are different places where you can use an MSA, as I said before. You can use it in the measure phase. That's the most common place. But you can also use it when you're developing a monitoring and a control plan. So let's just start out by talking about what a measurement system is. Uh, it is a gauge, right? It could be a, a tire gauge or a ruler or something like that. But it could also be a definition of what a measurement is. Or it could be a job aid. Okay, or it could be a form, or it could be where we keep data. All of those, and or it could be the people and the training and the procedures that they use. So it's, it, it can be all of those um, different things. So lots of different things. Every measurement that we have has an associated measurement system with it. Um, all right, and we already talked about that. Um, so what are some good characteristics of measurement systems? Good measurement systems are accurate, okay? That means, on average, and, <clears throat> and, and, and statisticians love to say this, but on average, it measures correctly. All right, so I'll be personal here. So that means if I get on my scale <laughs> repeatedly at home and measure my weight, that it ends up being the true weight, right? For those of you who struggle with your weight, like I struggle a little bit with mine, it's always on a little bit high side. Um, uh, what happens when I go to the doctor? <laughs> when I go to the doctor, I'm always like five pounds heavier than I am at home. That's an on average problem, okay? All right, because there's a bias between those two. We call it a bias between those two measurement systems. One is measuring me heavier, one is measuring me lighter, okay, on average. The second thing is, though, that measurement systems need to be precise. And that means that, they're self, that the measurements are self-consistent. So if I measure 185, I'm pretty comfortable that it's 80, 185 plus or minus 2, 3 pounds. Okay? If I get on the scale and it says 185, and I don't know whether it's 170 or 200, that's a problem for me. Right? Um, nobody wants a weather report that says it might be accurate <clears throat> using our, our definitions here. It might be on average okay if you say, Oh, come to Ithaca, New York. What's the temperature? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's 50 degrees, plus or minus 50. <laughs> well, that might be correct, but it's not, it might be accurate, that statement, but it's not very precise. So we care about both of those different things. And then we also want it to be stable over time. We want it to be, that measurement to be stable over time. We can already see that to do this, we're going to use a control chart. And I'm not going to cover that in this class. But we could easily just put that on a control chart, right? Make a measurement of something, whatever that is, if it's uh, some standard, and do that over time. And if that remains stable over time, that means that the measurement system is, is uh, stable over time, right? So with our pizza example, what we could do is get a very accurate thermometer. Uh, once a week, put it, in, uh, put it in the oven, put our temperature gauge at, uh, at what it's supposed to be, and check to see whether that's stable over time, whether it's giving that same reading. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, here's just the picture of the accuracy and precision. So here's something that is accurate and precise. So it's on target in the bullseye, plus we're getting that all the time. 
Here is something that's precise, but it's not accurate. You see, that's, that right there is what we call a bias. It's off on average. See that? So it's very precise, uh, but it's not accurate. This is something that a statistician would say is accurate, but not precise. Why am I saying it's accurate? Because on average, we're hitting that target. It's centered on the target. Notice this is a little bit different than the language that we use every day. And I'm not so sure it's all that useful. So a precise, definitely. Precise is definitely something that not everybody's always thinking about. But accuracy, at least in our word, uh, it, works, it, it, it focuses on the average. What you might say uh, if, you go, if you have a problem with, um, with talking about it that way, and I wouldn't blame you, by the way, because a lot of people, when you say, is a measurement accurate, they just say, they're just talking about, is it correct, right? Not is it precise and on average correct. They want to know whether it's actually, whether it, that particular measurement is exactly correct. So uh, maybe you say, well, there's two things. We want it to be on average right, and we want it to be tight or precise. And I think that, that probably works. This is, uh, especially the word accuracy can be a little bit misleading. It's too... Um, Statisticians have a very precise meaning, but once we get out of the statistics realm and we have to use it in the rest of business, it's not always that precise of a meaning. I, I understand the I irony of using the word precise to define this. Um, but anyway, precision is, a, is one that a lot of people are not always thinking about. So, good to bring that up. Okay. Um, so, uh, the, the, the key thing is that the two things, for, forget about all these words here for just a second. So, accuracy, we measure it by bias. On average, how off, are, on average, are we off the target? That's what bias means. And then precision is measured by, it says measured by gauge variation. Let's not worry about that. It's all, the, the key thing is, this is all about variation. Okay? This is all about the plus or minus. Okay, this is all about the target, and this is all the plus, all about the plus or minus around that target. Okay, so those we need both of those things. Okay, so let's um, let us, as the rabbit said, let's do an example here. Um, let's do an example here, and um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Before before we start out, I, I want to show you. We'll do an example. You know what? I, I want to do an example. I'm tired of not doing an example. So let's see if I went to, where is the first one? Uh, let's go to the example on 104. Okay. So we're going to do an MSA example uh, of gauge R&R. &R. Uh, that's the file that we're going to do. And here's what we have, okay? We have five parts. Let's put this in a manu. Uh, let's think about it in manufacturing, but it's easily. I think you'll find that we can easily flip over many of the ideas uh, into uh, transactional services as well, with one exception, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so let's suppose that we're making. Uh, uh, let's suppose that we're making widgets or we're making optical tables. Um, could be either of those. Okay, we have five parts re representing the spread of the product. So these are standard parts, and we're trying to get, if this is the spread of our product over some uh, characteristic, let's say um, some performance characteristic, uh, maybe complexity or something like that, we, we have five products that kind of represent that spread from you know, the least complex, the simplest, simplest to the most complex. Okay, we have two operators from this uh, production. We chose two operators from production, and each measure, each operator measured the, each part three times. Okay, so you can see now that this is really <clears throat> so. Um, uh, let, let's put this in context. So here we've got a total number of measurements: uh, five times two times three. Two operators, five parts, each measured three times. That's thirty. Okay. So this is sort of like a design experiment where we're looking at some measurement. I don't know what that gauge measurement is. Let's just say performance. Whatever that is, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, and I've got three factors, A, B, and C. <laughs> My A factor is called 
parts. I want to see if parts vary, if performance varies by part. My second one is operator. And even though this is going to muddy the water a little bit, um, um, so I'm not going to I'm not going to dwell on it too much. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, but uh, this is uh, this is iteration because we're measuring uh, things uh, multiple times. We're not going to focus on this. We'll focus on the first two, and that's always the measurement uh, the measurement uh, system question is. Is it my part that's changing, or is it my operator, the person who's measuring, that's the problem? <laughs> is it the measurement that's the problem, or is it, is it the measurer that's the problem, or is it the, the part that's causing the problem? Okay? So, um, so we're going to do this example. Um, um, and uh, let's just kind of do it by hand. So let's, um, I'm going to open up the, uh, the file. I'm going to show you how to do it um, in uh, just using old Excel statistics, and I think uh, you'll see that it's it's not that it's not that bad. So it's this one right here, and so we've got an output that's our response. We've got the part, and we've got the operator, and so what we're going to do is we're going to just if we just focus on part and operator, I've got one num two cat, right? Come back to this, erase all that. I've got one num, that's my output. And I've got two cat. I've got part and I've got operator. <clears throat> now two things can happen here. I can look and I can find operators have problems with all the parts. Or I could look at, uh, at something and I find maybe one operator has problems with one of the parts or multiple parts or whatever. So there's a number of different things I can find. Let's, let's just take a look and see what we can with this an, uh, an analysis. Sorry, I'm getting tongue-tied at this point. So I'm opening this up. Choose this. Let's go to... I see what happens here. Okay, let's... There's Excel statistics. Try that again. One num, two cat. We haven't used this one before, but I think you'll find that it's uh, fairly fairly straightforward. So the first thing you need to do is see where it says N there? You need to get the right number. You need to get the right thing in there. So that was our output. And then the other two don't matter. Uh, we also had part and we had operator. Those are the ones that we care about. Um, so there you go. You can see that this experiment is balanced. It had uh, uh, five parts, each measured three times by operators one and two. And uh, we're able to see the output uh, based on um, which operator. So on the first one, this tells us uh, we can look at the histogram of any of these. Not all that interested in that. I'm interested in this. And uh, this, by looking at this, I can tell which parts had uh, better out or had higher output and which ones um, the operators differed on. So for example, I can look at this one and I can say if I knew something about the, let's say that five was the most complex, I could look here and I can see, um, let me just, let me remove that for just a second. Let's put it the standard error. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I can see, for example, that uh, um, I can see, for example, that uh, on this complex part, operators one and two have problems agreeing with each other. Okay. It also looked, it looks like there's a problem over here as well that there's uh, that there's that they have a problem agreeing with each other on this. Okay. So <clears throat> again, it's it's no great shakes here uh, for what we can for what we can do. Uh, and what we can analyze, but here we're looking at the parts, we're looking at the uh, at the uh, at the different operators, and uh, we're seeing who measures them differently or the same. What might be something that uh, so the analysis is pretty straightforward. You just have to look at this one plot, and and that's pretty good. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. So. 
what happened there? Why did I? That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to the Excel. Oh, oh, the other Excel. That's it. Okay. So, what um, what would be helpful if I wanted to sh to know whether the operators were measuring something correctly? What might be helpful for me? You need to know the target value. I, I need to know the target value, right? So if I had a um, if I had a um, well, let's just call it a target value, but you really talk, like, if I put in a standard part, right, and I had that calibrated, whatever that calibrated value is, right, let's say I was, what, truth, I'll just call it truth. <laughs> I need to know truth, right? So if I knew truth for this particular part, notice that this isn't production, right? So you're taking people out of production to do 30 measurements, so there's some cost to this. But if I knew the truth, and I knew that this, the truth were 150, I could look at that delta and see who was off by how much, if that makes sense. Right, but I didn't have that here, so I couldn't do any more, um, I couldn't do any more with that. Um, um, but uh, anyway, so, so, um, so that's that. So I, the first thing I guess I would say, or the, the last thing I would say is, here we're looking at the, the, uh, the variation, so we can look at the precision but can we look at the bias for this? We can't because we don't have the truth. We don't know what the truth is, so we can't tell the, diff the difference from average. So I'm going to show you how to get around that uh, with the next example, and I think that one's going to really uh, hopefully flesh it out. So um, I want to go to the, it, there's a lot of interesting mini tab stuff that's there. I want to go to uh, this final one, and then I want to, this example right here called invoice reconciliation. Um, and we actually used something very, very, very similar to this, not on invoices, um, last year in a project with, um, uh, with uh, processing claims, uh, process, well, processing claims. So we had people who were QAing those claims processors, and uh, we wanted to QA the QAers. So we used a, a process that was very similar to this. So let's go through this example. Here I've got, let's say I've got some invoices, and I've got some people that are doing reconciliations on them. Um, and I, oops, I've got three, let's say I've got three types of invoices. I've got low complexity, I've got medium complexity, and I've got high complexity. Maybe this is for a simple account, maybe it's for a conglomerate, and, and for a giant conglomerate, right? Full range of production. I used three auditors here, from inexperienced um, to very experienced, okay? So I'm getting the gamut of the auditors as well. So I'm choosing auditors that are uh, over the, I think you're seeing the point. Is I want to choose things that are over, essentially over the range of, the typical range of production. Here's the other thing that we didn't do last time in the last example. All invoices are pre-audited by a team of experts who determine the true value of the reconciliation. So this will allow me to check for bias. So I'm going to do both of those, okay? So I can tell how far it is off the target. Okay, so now we're going to perform an accuracy -ish, uh, study, and then we're going to perform a variation study. And uh, we'll do this together and see how it works. Okay, so let's open up first of, uh, first of all, let's open up the reconciliation. Invoice reconciliation. And here it is. So I've got the run. There's 27 runs. I've got three auditors, which I'm calling low, medium, and high. I guess that's low experience, medium experience, and high experience, and invoice, which is low, medium, and high complexity. And then I've got the measured and the actual. So the actual, that's the, that's the expert opinion. So before I want to do anything, I want to kind of take the delta here, don't I? If I take the delta between measured and actual, that, uh, I'll just call it the difference. Um, and uh, let's, let's do actual minus the measured. That tells me, for example, minus 20. I don't know what that means exactly. Maybe they're off by $20. Let's just say what that is for the purpose of, of this discussion here. Let's say that that's what it is. I'm going to make that a little bit easier to read, hopefully. There we go. Okay. Um, and so forth. So now I've got this difference, 
And how can I measure whether it's biased or not? Well, if it were unbiased, that is, if it's on average uh, the same as the truth, we would expect this to be uh, averaging out to zero, right? So we can check that pretty. Oops, we can check that pretty quickly. Uh, we can check the bias by just doing a one num analysis on this. So let's go ahead and do that. <clears throat> and uh, if we put our standard error there, yeah, it doesn't really look like bias is too much of an issue. But let, let's you know, let's just put our regular analysis hats on. What are the things that you're noticing here? Uh, not an yeah, so Mike, what was that? Oh, get both of your comments. But. I was saying it's not normal. It's a lot of variation. There's a lot of variation, and it's not normal. And Steve, is there something else? I think that there are some outlying points. Yeah, so I think both of those things are true. Um, uh, I think both of those things are true. It looks on average that we're off a little bit on the negative side, but that could be largely driven by those two outliers. And in fact, if we kind of look at a confidence interval around that, we can do that. This is a poor person's confidence interval. I'm just looking two standard errors. You can see it overlaps zero. Let's actually look at that test. Yeah, see it overlap. The confidence interval overlaps zero. It goes from minus 12 to, to two. So we can't say there's really a, an on average problem but there could be, there could very well be a variation problem, um, and it could be, um, I, you know, that I want to know what's going on with some of these. So let's take a look at that um, using that other tool. So if we go back to here, so bias is simple. The on average stuff, you just look at the difference between the actual and the measured, and you want to see if it's off on average. Now you can combine that by looking at a one or two variables at a time. I'm going to recommend that we look at auditor and invoice together, and let's see what that is. So that's one num two cat. Remember, we've got to change this so that we have our n variable under the m. The n variable I care about is difference. Mm, sorry about that. <clears throat> and the the uh, uh, I want to look at it by auditor and invoice. Oh yeah, I've got it already. So this isn't all that interesting. Looks like I've got a nice balanced design here. Aha! So what do we see here? What do you see here? I'll make this a little bit bigger. Let's take off yeah. that. Let's take that off. There. <laughs> How about this? In the, the, the low invoice is driving all the variation. Ah, but is it the invoice or is it the auditor? Sorry, the auditor. Yeah, it looks like it's the auditor, and in fact, um, it's worse for it's also worse for the complexity, right? So this would be a good case, right? This is this this particular uh, line is the auditor. You can switch that around if you don't like the view here. If you like a different view, um, we can switch those variables around. I'll show you what that is just as soon as I finish it. But again, you know, I don't think we need to dwell too much. This is the issue. We want all these things. These guys are pretty darn close to zero, <clears throat> which is what we want, right? We want the difference to be zero. This guy, on the other hand, um, <clears throat> he's off. And in fact, he's off always in one direction, right? He's always off on a negative direction. So I guess that means he's estimating high because um, we're taking the invoice actual minus the, the guys reported. Okay. And it's it looks like it's worse. Um, this is moderate. This is uh, no. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. This is low, and this is the most complex. I guess that's not as pronounced. This is the medium complexity, but definitely it's having problems with high complexity. So this could give you a, a good uh, opportunity to go in and coach this particular person, or um, if this person was representative of what you thought was sort of low experience operators it might be a good point to say, okay, for all of these uh, fairly inexperienced uh, people who are doing these reconciliations, we need to spend a little bit more time going over the rules of how to do this. Uh, we don't need to do it for the other people, so it, it's not just like, uh, notice that this is a lot more directed than, hey, let's uh, give everybody training. Um, it's more directed than that. 
And that's where it can be, I think, uh, particularly helpful. Um, and that's the main thing I wanted to show you, uh, is basically um, it's an experiment that you set up uh, where you give people uh, canned um, uh, uh, artifacts. We call them artifacts, but it could be, you know, if you're measuring optical tables, it would be, uh, you know, components of an optical table. If you're measuring invoices, it would be that. If you're measuring something else, it would be, if you're measuring claims, it would be claims. So in the example where <coughs> I worked with the claims processors, we, <coughs> excuse me, we literally took a complex claim, a medium complex claim, and a, and a very simple claim, and uh, gave them to the operators and, and had, them, uh, had them look at each of those. And uh, we found out, you know, who were the auditors that were doing well and who weren't. Um, and you can extend this idea to all sorts of other things, but um, that's, what's, uh, that's what's going on. Um, uh, now, I did want to, uh, not to go back to FMEA, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, let's see, it was like 120? No. Right here. I did want to talk a little bit about practical considerations, and I think I'll stop and just take all your questions. Um, <clears throat> some of the practical things that the parts or the invoices or whatever your artifacts are, they need to represent the full operating range of production. Not, not extreme operating range. Don't pick the really pathological examples. Um, you know, if you're picking people, you don't pick Shaquille O'Neal, but you might pick the tallest, one, a typical tallest person that you see in the group. Um, you want to use the same conditions as usual. So don't pick always the best or worst auditors. Um, if you have a, a team of about 30 QA people, I wouldn't necessarily go out and say who's my best QA and who's my worst QA person. Um, I might pick a representation of people who are experienced uh, and pretty good at their jobs and people who aren't. Um, don't perform special training beforehand, okay? Uh, I see teams do that a lot. We're going to do a we're going to do a measurement study. Okay, guys, make sure we get this right. No, <laughs> what you want to do is you want to have it as close to production as possible. And some people have even gone into integrating this into production, um, uh, where every once in a while, uh, uh, more than one person will get it. So, um, if you're processing claims, every I'm totally making this up. Let's say every thousandth claim. Um, every person who's auditing it gets that claim and they all do it. And so you're wasting a little bit of time or you're spending a little bit of time and money on doing this, um, but then you're able to look and see how everybody did the same thing. Okay, I think those are the main uh, practical uh, things. Um, in the next section, which we're n I'm not going to cover, but I'm happy to talk to individually, it is on the, uh, it is on the web. The, the basically, the, the same. It, it, it's how do I do the same thing? Um, how do I do the same thing if I have category data? If I have just pass fail data at the end, and it's essentially the same way. And whether you want to use a pivot table to do it, or you want to use Excel stats, it works the same way. You take the difference from whether they were right or wrong. In this case, it's either a one or a zero. You have a measure something like an attribute of. Uh, is this, uh, is this part good or is it bad? Uh, they'll rate it, and uh, you have a team of experts determine the same thing, and you look and you see you know, how off they are. You pick the parts to represent the full range of production, and you're good. And you look at the same sorts of things. You see, is this particular operator having a problem with this part or that part, or is it every operator? And, um, and that's about it. So um, I'm going to stop here. And uh, this is a, this is, um, hopefully it's not as bad as uh, it sometimes is, but it's a, it can be a tricky concept because we're not interested in the measurements per se. We're interested in, excuse me, we're interested in measuring the, the measurers. So it's the people that are, are doing the measuring. Those are the people, those are the things that we're measuring here. Okay. Or the, the measuring system is what we're trying to measure to see if it comes out right. So a lot of times we have to create a system where, uh, a situation where we already know the answer that we're supposed to get. That's why we create the team of experts to look at the invoices or to look at the, the, uh, the claims or to look at the, uh, the calibrated part or whatever beforehand. Okay, um, so I'm going to stop here. 
Um, you know, make sure you write in your views what are the key takeaways of this. And uh, I think one of the key takeaways, at least for me, is that it doesn't have to be that complex, the analysis. Just do the simple things and uh, you already know how to do it. We already covered all that stuff in the data analysis algorithm. So you're good with that. So with that, I'm going to stop the recording. I will stay on the line and I'll wish everybody a good, safe, and uh, happy, and hopefully flu-free uh, weekend. I'm going to wish the same to myself, and hopefully that'll be, uh, hopefully it'll, it'll be true. And uh, we'll see you on Tuesday. I've made the promise that I'm going to get the assignments back to, assignment number three back to you on Monday, so you should be looking for that. And uh, I'll talk to you later. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.